<laughs> okay, so it's uh, it's over for it's three. Fantastic. So the problem. The problem is how we doing here. That's the problem. Let's go. <laughs> okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, so we're on to the questions from all of the lectures of the day. So um, no doubt there will be a set of questions which you all have from the course of the day's lectures that you will want answers to. So we'll have them now, uh, and then we'll move on if we have time to talk a bit about the gold, gold basis. So questions, questions. Uh, Sandeep, I'd like to just add. Uh, Rudy has a comment. Something yeah. I forgot to mention. Uh, I don't think I mentioned it. I use, I like to paraphrase the Buddha, and the Buddha said to his disciples, "Don't believe everything." or anything to be true just because of tradition, just because tradition tells you it's true. Then he says, don't believe anything to be true just because authority tells you something is true. And then, incredibly enough, he says, don't believe anything to be true just because the Buddha tells you it's true. And the disciples were speechless, like, well, what do we believe, Buddha? And he says, only believe that which you understand, which you figure out, which you thought through. So I like everybody to think for themselves. And at the end of the day, don't believe a word I say unless it makes sense to you, unless you can, you can see it and fit it into your own understanding. Because one of the biggest problems in the world is people are waiting to be told what to do, what to think, and that's the problem. That's the root problem, the, the, the you know, consciousness problem. For whatever it's worth, I'm not supposed to say this because Robert told me not to, but I gotta say it anyways. I had my birthday not long ago, my 65th, my retirement birthday, and a little cake from my daughter. I said, make a wish, make a wish. I did. My wish was that the world would wake up and get some consciousness. Wake up, world. So I hopefully you guys wake up here and uh, figure this out for yourself. And if you have questions and not clear, look. and the war issue was really important because no, you cannot finance war with real bills. It's impossible. It, there's no gold coming back from productive enterprise, from consumers. Capital is being destroyed. Gold is being destroyed. But that the this. example I give is, is a one a little stream of expenses. Of course. Because there's so many streams before they get there. And the cost of the <coughs> No end to it, of course, trillions. <coughs> so so the, let's go with the questions. Okay, so... Uh, I, I just have a question regarding uh, the, uh, the talk this morning from Professor. Uh, and I think he has uh, wrote a letter, an open letter to uh, Congressman Ron Paul in April last year, and I just wonder whether you ever got the response on that letter. Who, who about you wrote? Uh, the serious question about the uh, legality of quantitative easing. You wrote an open letter you wrote he, to Ron Paul. No, you wrote a letter to Ron Paul. Did you oh, yeah, get yeah, a reply? Yeah. yeah, no, no. No. You never got an answer on that. No answer to that. No, which is very strange because, uh, you know, I, I have a very good relation to the Congress, with the congressman, which goes back to 25 years. Yes. However, I also know how congressional offices work. Uh, it's the assistants who put the letter on the desk of the congressman. So they exercise a virtual censorship. So unless you bribe them, probably the letter will never go on his desk. You should you never have told him that he will get a letter from you, then he might answer it. <laughs> anyway, I just wanted yeah. to... Yeah. And uh, it's, I also know, because I myself worked in a congressional office for uh, five years, actually, Don, uh, Congressman Dunnemeyer of uh, California. And there are hundreds, if not thousands, of letters go out with fake signature. The certain assistants are authorized to sign letters for the congressman, and the letter was never seen by the congressman. <laughs> so it's a farce, <laughs> you know. Okay. 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 Okay.
it's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. May I add, um, um, Professor Joseph T. Salerno um, didn't directly answer this letter of Professor Fikete, but in an interview with Leonie Bell, I think there will be one interview with him, so if you're interested, you can find it. Leonie Bell is an online uh, news website. Uh, he he's asked about this letter, and, and he gives his opinion of Professor Fikete's opinion. I'm not sure what, what the issue was, but I'm not an expert in, 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 in the pseudo legal system of the United States, so, so I can't quite know. But if you're interested, you can look at that. And uh, I just add to this, I highly doubt that, that uh, Ron Paul would accept any bribes in any case. And anybody who knows him and closer um, knows that, that he's, he's very. No, he's talking about bribing his assistants. Well, yes. <laughs> to get the letter to him. <laughs> not Ron himself. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions, Diego? Um, I have a, well, just several points, really. Um, I mean, I guess I understand the distingui distinction you made between a, a certificate or a promise to pay gold and the gold coin, but my understanding is that really how the Mises Institute or how Rothbard or where the Soto will interpret a gold certificate, it's, it's not a liability in nobody's balance sheet. It's, for example, as an asset manager, if you have an account with an asset manager, the money that is represented in that account is not really the balance sheet of the asset manager. It's just funds under management. Mm -hmm. And they can issue a certificate <coughs> saying, oh, uh, Diego has X amount of stocks of such and such company, X and X uh, certificates of this other bond and things like that. So a gold certificate would be very similar. Um, it's not in the it's not a liability of this company, but rather it's just a certification of this warehousing or this bank that in fact Diego does have deposited in this bank X amount of gold or silver or whatever it is. Um, I mean, I I think that one criticism the people you know George Selgin and the people from the fractional reserve have on this idea is that well there will be it will be very difficult to execute our payments, you know, it will be very costly because you actually have a warehouse and how do you uh, deal physically by moving gold? But I think that's um, it's 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 a badly formed criticism because really um, they would uh, form part of a clearing system. So I, I just don't think it's a valid criticism for the part of George Selby. So so on that sense um, and uh, basing myself on what Rudy said on his experience when he inherited uh, her mother's uh, gold and her gold certificate, independently of the fact that, I mean, you didn't actually get the gold because of the legal situation which, or those legal circumstances, um, and assuming the warehouse is not stealing that gold, I mean, in fact, a gold certificate is would, what is the position of your school in that sense? Like, is it or is it not a... Okay, let me get to the root of this. Who owns the gold? You do. Oh, then why, do I get better, why can't I get it back? You are warehousing my gold. I put my, I put my table yes, or my but, chair. But that's my, well, he asked the question, please. Let me finish the answer. Okay? But you that's asked the question. He intervened in inheritances. If you ask the question, I'm trying to answer you. So let me finish my answer. My, the point is, who owns the gold? And this is always the question. That's the first question. And the second question is, who is in possession of it? And there's an old saying that says, possession is nine tenths of the law. Now, the Germans' gold, presumably, maybe, is in a, a, a warehouse or a bunker under the Federal Reserve Building or Fort Knox. Who owns the gold? It's Germans' gold. Who is in possession? The Americans. <laughs> what happens when, if, when, if, when Germans say, send us back our gold? Not Chavez for 400 tons, but Merkel for 3,000 tons. Will they get it or won't they? Okay, so so that that's the kind of hard knocks thing. When I had the gold bar in my hand, it was in my gold, it was my possession, it was my mother's gold, came to my hand from her, say, to my hand. Okay, the so paperwork had to go through this circuit and it was interrupted by legalities, as you say. Okay, so in that sense, I mean, if you're willing to say 
that a gold certificate, certificate uh, in which you own the gold legally speaking, no, I mean maybe nine tenths is the possession is in somebody else's hand, it, I mean under the unadulterated gold standard, a gold certificate, I'm not sure if that's the correct name, uh, from a bank um, will be backed uh, by gold and real bills of goods whose possessions are not in, pos in the bank. Okay. Also, so it's Let me address that too. There's no need for bank notes. Gold and bills on their own can do all this. Gold and bills. Gold coins, gold bars, gold bills. Yes? Thank you. Now, the problem with bills per se is bills come in odd denominations. You've got 3,022 ounce denomination here and 343 ounce point six there. And it's relatively a pain in the butt to exchange it for nominal units. So a company comes along, free market guy, there's a spread. I can offer a piece of paper that says 10 ounces, 100 ounces, 5 ounces, like this, and substitute them for those odd numbers. And what, but, but you don't need this. This is a convenience. And if push comes to shove, you will take the gold. And then if things are a little bit better and you're trading and you're Iran and, and India, you'll take the bills. And if things are even more trusting and, and I don't know if banks will ever make it back or call them discount houses, they may just accept this certificate or paper or whatever clearly understood that there is either gold or a bill behind it. Because the bills do circulate and they can do their function without banknotes. And in fact, that's the way it was. Banknotes came after. Diego, the way that you asked the question first was that it's not an asset mm. on the balance sheet. Okay, it's like you go to a warehouse, mm -hmm. you put something in the warehouse. Okay, so then the warehouseman gives you a certificate. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, the warehouseman should have no idea what you've just stored in there. So it should just say there's something in here and it's yours. Mm -hmm. So why would you put that it's a gold? certificate you know it's like well, in inviting example, um, I mean, it's like so that's different that's what I'm saying is it's yeah. a bailment is different from a gold certificate because the warehouseman is recognizing that you put gold in this warehouse which well, they shouldn't be doing um, well but uh, it's like um, okay I mean it doesn't work like that in like uh, the agricultural market like for some reason in the agricultural market when you deposit uh, grain um, possession still, and even though it's mixed, possession still remains, I mean, uh, property still remains with the farmer. Yes. But regardless of that, um, so, but, but what Rui just said is that there will be no certificates issued at all because there will only be gold and real bills circulating. I can't imagine. There could be. I mean, if you trust your banker to leave your gold with your banker and accept certificates, and other people will accept them. There's nothing to preclude that from happening. Oh, well, but, I mean, but the point is that under your, um, I'm just trying to make sure if I'm understanding, or I'm not trying to argue against it or in favor mm -hmm. right now. I'm just trying to understand. In, under your system, that gold certificate, certificate, it would be legal to back it up by real bills. Whose no. no. It would not be legal. No. So a deposit account, would not be back. We're money. talking bank notes, not gold certificates. Bank no. notes. Okay, so a bank note. And that is a liability of the bank. And 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 sending is exactly right. This is a just a, a deposit slip in effect that says I have whatever there. So we go back. To, the story is simple. If you bring a piece of furniture to the warehouse, you get a receipt and a date, and you pay something for the storage, and 30, 60, 90 days later, a year later, you get your furniture back. Mm -hmm. Now, what if, what if the warehouse owner decides to rent out your furniture, or sell it, and when you come to claim it, so wow, we got some other furniture just as good, this is it. Oh, that's outrageous, that was my furniture. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. And if the warehouse company goes bankrupt, the judge will rule, hopefully still today, that yes, the furniture belongs to those who deposit it and put it in there, and the rest of the stuff, the warehouse, the forklift, goes to the creditors. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, several hundred years ago, in England, under common law, there was a, a, a ruling that if you deposit your money in the bank, 
money being gold and silver then, it is no longer your money, it's the bank's money. And you become a general creditor of the bank. And, and Peter has the references, there were at least two or three other cases that confirmed this. Only for money. So now, instead of me deciding with the warehouse man, okay, I've got my furniture, oh, you can lend it out? How much are you going to pay me? Okay, rent it out. For how long? Okay. Is it insured? Is it this? You know, you deal with the warehouse man because it's your property. But when the bank's property, then the bank deals with who? With the government, with the, 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 you know. So they decide what to do with your money. We're the experts. We'll you know, lend it long, borrow it short, stretch it, copy it, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So that was the first invasion of property rights. That was at the very root, the very first, boop, down that slippery slope. And then before World War I came legal tender laws, and then, uh, what's his name, confiscating the gold, uh, Roosevelt, and then Nixon, you know, so that was tuck, 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 like this. Right now, today, you've heard of MF Global? Yeah. Oh, you haven't. Well, 1.6, how many, 1.6 billion? 1.6 billion dollars disappeared. <laughs> Where did it go? Oh, it was stolen. Somebody's <laughs> Property rights were invaded. Now these, these were futures contracts, and they just kind of like lost them. Now, what happened? So the property rights are invaded again. Now it's not only, and, and oh yeah, and a U.S. Uh, appeals court, federal appeals court ruled just lately, well, there was no criminal intent. No criminal <laughs> they didn't mean to lose your money. They got <laughs> lost in the chaotic situation, and, and Corzine is not going to be charged. <laughs> so this slippery slope of property rights invasion is <laughs> ratcheting down. And now, uh, what's the name of that company I was talking about? Uh, not Merrill Lynch, but um, Morgan, uh, Morgan Stanley. Uh, there's the rumors going around on the internet that Morgan Stanley will be the next Bear Stearns, the next want to disappear and they hold a lot of equities so the question now becomes will money becomes theirs futures contracts becomes theirs now shares equities become theirs through confusion so keep your eye open for that um, and so i mean but in my ideal world the payment system will be some kind of a paypal but backed up by gold so but, I mean, you don't like this idea at all. I, I, don't, I wouldn't go that far. I, you know, first of all, people need the gold coin, the real stuff in their hands, and yes, in their like pockets. Yes, but like you say, the marginal payer or buyer would require the gold. But most people would not. Well, why not? Why? So, okay, here's another one. I just wrote another article on this. You know the golden rule? He who has the gold makes the rules. Now, mm. under the... Under the, the, the classical gold standard, the 19th century, the 1800s, uh, Great Britain ran most of the civilized world, the British Empire. And the Bank of England, you know how much gold they had in their warehouse? Give me a number. You know how much? There's 8,000 tons in the U.S. What do you think they had? In which period? 19th century? Yeah, under the, hate, under the, the, the classical gold standard period. 1,000 tons. 150 to 200. At the beginning of the century, it was 150 tons. 150 to 200. You can look this up. It's in the records, in, in, in the official account. And there were tens of thousands of tons of gold in circulation out there. And every one of those coins carries some power, a vote choose to spend, choose to invest, choose to hoard, and that ran the system. Now, today, there is maybe 8,000 tons of gold in the U.S. vault, and maybe 3,000 in the other guys, and whatever, so ten, tens of thousands of tons of gold are in their vaults. How much gold is in circulation? Zero. So who's got the power? <laughs> All the power. And that's why I want gold back in people's hands and pockets. And then if they choose, to, you know, and maybe tiny little bits could be in a plastic uh, something or who cares. I mean, these are technicalities. Market will take care of it. But the principle is the gold has to be in everybody's hand, and they all make their choices, and then all this, all this stuff comes out of it. Emergent phenomena. Let me just add something, if I may. This is, this is an issue I've thought about a great deal. What, what would you have in terms of banking services in the free market? 
So I think the marginal saver will have a coin at home, absolutely. I think to Diego's point, there would be a vaulting service that would charge 50 basis points per year to hold your, to hold your gold for you, and that would be a bailment. That's your property, not theirs, and they're just simply holding it for you. And then additionally, you can pay additional fees to transfer it, like pay power or gold money, if you want to pay somebody else. I think the next step is the demand deposit account that would not, you would not have to pay to have that account. Uh, and you might even get a little bit of interest. It might be zero. The demand deposit, the bank would have some gold, but, but largely bills. And then the time deposit account where the, where the bank would back, you know, 95 or 98% of it with bonds that match the duration of the, obviously, you know, in the free market, people are, are free to go from one end of the spectrum to the other. I suspect they're going to tend to be in demand deposits and time deposits mostly because when you say that you have to pay 50 basis points a year to store the gold, I have a funny feeling that would be a deterrent to most people. Just my personal speculation on that. Say, um, I'd like to make a couple of points to go back to uh, your uh, presentation earlier today. Um, they're both related and they pertain to uh, the issue of maturity mismatch, which is the main talk of your uh, talk, as well as the uh, issue of anarchy, um, which I think relates to it, and you'll see how if you just bear with me for a couple of minutes while I uh, express what I'm trying to say. And my, my basic problem is that uh, I don't think your definition that you propose of anarchy is accurate. The way you define anarchy is that it is Everybody has the right to legal to legal uh, violence. Everybody can go and do what they want. And in fact, anarchy is the exact opposite. And, um, the term is a negative term, and it begins with an, meaning no, archy, archy meaning governance. So, if monarchy is the divine right of kings, democracy is the divine right of parliaments, theocracy is the divine right of people who pretend to be speaking in the name of God, anarchy is the divine right of nobody. Anarchy is the idea that nobody has the right to resort to coercion against anybody else. Now, what happens when somebody does? Well, that's the point. So, so in somebody the argument, picks up a gun in uh, violation of the rights of everybody else and commits murder, what happens next? I would appreciate if you would let me go through my argument because I am, I have actually thought of that and a lot of people have thought of that question before. Okay. Um, so the basic idea is that if society lives in a place where people believe that no form of um, coercion is legitimate, and this is a social contract that exists amongst us, and it is based on the idea that no form of coercion is legitimate. So when somebody carries out a gun and uses force, everybody recognizes that as illegitimate, and then everybody reacts to that without, in a way that deters that sort of behavior from happening. And there are two ways to do this. In case of somebody carrying out a grievous crime, you could, you know, everybody could get together and punish them physically. But most likely, and what it will most likely be enough is, Shunning. We live in a human society. We have a mother and a father and friends and family and colleagues. And if, if you commit a crime, everybody shuns you. Nobody wants to buy from you. Nobody wants to sell you. You would die in a society if a society refuses to deal with you. And that on its own is usually the deterrent. So, so um, and from the anarchist perspective, it is precisely this, the, the, this um, in a sense, this idea that the we are afraid of this guy with a bigger gun, so we want to give a policeman and an even bigger gun to protect us from the guy with a big gun. Well, from, from anarchist, in, in anarchist thinking, this is just a way for the guy with the biggest gun to justify hold, holding the big gun on your head. You see what I mean? So government is that guy with the big gun that is threatening everybody else. And um, nationalism, monarchy, democracy, theocracy, these are just little excuses that they use in order to legitimate their rule. Now, why is this relevant to our discussion on economics? Because it goes precisely back to your point on um, maturity transformation. Um, your point was that you want to ban maturity transformation. Now, I think maturity no, transformation, not. you said it needs to be made illegal. I said that was the professor's position. My position was we have to be very careful. What standard do we uphold before we can declare something to be illegal? And what I propose that standard should be is that if someone is initiating the use of force against somebody else, and fraud is a simple corollary of force, and there is an obvious initiator of force, and there is an obvious victim, then that should be a crime. But if we want to talk about potential negative social impacts, that that should not be a crime. 
because that's a slippery slope and we can start to outlaw anything that any specialty group yes. says drugs are bad, having too many children is bad, uh, shooting yourself in the foot is bad, having too few children is bad, driving yes. a car is so, bad. So, 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 so the point I'm trying to make is that um, it's, it, it's not a, in, in a free market, the whole idea is that you don't need to ban anything or make any rules on it. Bad practices that are harmful to people will not be carried out simply because nobody will force you to deal with a bank that does maturity transformation. And the key point is that maturity transformation fails in a free market. The reason we have it today is precisely because we do not have a free market. Maturity transformation and any form of fraud, basically, and I agree with uh, entirely on your problem with uh, maturity transformation, it would not exist simply because a bank that did it would be very likely to be um, subject to a bank run at a certain point and then it would collapse. So nobody would want to put their money in. So it's a very similar concept to why don't restaurants poison people? Should we have the government um, coercively regulate the restaurant business to make sure that they don't poison people? I don't think so because the you know, the idea of a restaurant poisoning their customers is a very bad business and the people aren't sociopaths, they don't open restaurants in order to poison customers, they open restaurants to make money. And you make money by offering good food. So the market itself provides the incentive for people to behave properly. And in, on the contrary, you find that in all industries that are regulated, where you bring in the um, coercive power of the government to regulate and enforce rules that apply to you without you even choosing to subscribe to them, this ends up being corrupted. So then once you introduce that rule, it ends up, um, the survival of a firm in the market, whether it's a restaurant in a restaurant business or it's a bank in the banking business, does not depend on serving the customer, who no longer can give their consent to the transaction because they're being forced to the transaction. It depends on how well connected that business is to the people who have the guns. And so that, to go back to the anarchist point, that is the rationale behind how we think of anarchism in that sense, that if you have a society built purely on the idea of consensual exchange between consenting adults, where everybody has the freedom to exchange, but nobody has any requirement to buy from somewhere, then you will, the free market solution, obviously, I'm sure everybody here is familiar with the argument from and I, and I believe that money, the, the money that would emerge from that, I think everybody also here would agree, would be gold. And I think that the banking system that would emerge from that would be a safe banking system. And if you wanted to go um, you know, beyond the minarchist position to the anarchist position, I believe this is how we can achieve a peaceful society, a civilized society where everybody um, interacts with everybody else based on a uh, on mutual consent. We'll, we'll, we'll just, if anyone has any more questions, um, does anyone have any questions that they want to ask? We can stay. No, okay. Hold on, I'd, I'd like to address this. Hold on, hold on, guys. It's fun, in a way, first of all, acknowledging that anarchism is obviously way out of scope for the New York School. I made my comment to talk about the rule of law and to, to establish a context for why I did not think we should outlaw uh, maturity mismatch. I'm not on the grounds that I defend maturity mismatch, but on the grounds that I don't think the state should regulate. And what I want to clarify, and I think we should, we should move away from the anarchism discussion. We're not necessarily going to get anywhere. This is a whole well, I, uh, excuse me, Keith, I'd like to put my two cents worth in. You started your discussion with an economic issue, that of a monopoly. A monopoly is an economic issue. And we all clearly, I hope, understand that monopolies are bad. Now, if monopolies are bad, you have to assume that all monopolies are bad. Uh, Bell monopoly, the police monopoly, the government monopoly. Why should a government be exempt from this law that says monopolies are bad? Now, there was a period uh, in England under common law where nobody was writing the laws and the jurors were discovering laws. And the very term outlaw comes from that time when if you, like you said, you disobey or you do bad things and you don't uh, recompense your victim, blah, blah, blah. At some point, you're declared outlaw. You're outside of the law and anybody can take your stuff, shoot you, whatever, with, with, with no, no such thing. Now, there's a book out there by Hans Hermann Hoppe called Democracy, The God That Failed. And he addresses a lot of these things, how civilized people can get together and choose their own system of defense. And if some guy grabs a gun, well, they're prepared for that. 
but they don't depend on the government monopoly to do it. It's just like an insurance company, you have a choice until the government forces a monopoly situation. You know? I don't think I addressed monopolies at all in my talk. I don't know. That's how you started. You said government, the, 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 the unilateral use of force belongs to the government. Okay, right. So I'm talking about the unilateral use of retaliatory force. I'm making a distinction between retaliation versus force and initiation. Okay. If a monopoly is created by force used in initiation, mm -hmm. that is bad. Yeah. If a monopoly arises in the market, I would not use the word monopoly to describe Microsoft, General Electric, IBM, mm -hmm. AT&T. AT&T is different because they have government supporting them mm -hmm. even back into the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, Anyways, my position is, no, I don't think the, pro the government should proactively regulate anybody because that's the initiation of the, for of the use of force. But I do think there cannot be such a thing as a market in the use of initiation force. The idea of a market in force is a contradiction in term. It's what we call stealing the concept. There, in order to have a free market, free means free from coercion. If, if, if there's such a thing as an assassin's guild, and I can hire an assassin to kill my political enemy or kill my business rival, then that isn't a free market anymore. That's something entirely else. The problem Anyways, is... I would, I, would, I would suggest that that the discussion of anarchism and monopolies... No, I'm not talking about anarchism. What I'm suggesting is you say the government should not initiate force, but it does. Well, today, well, the government is the initiation of That is the whole point. Oh, so Chairman Mao said power comes from the barrel of a gun. So keep the barrels away from the government. Reduce the government, get rid of the government, and have something else take its place. So that's all. Anyway, how are we doing? Uh, I think, yep. Yeah. Uh, because now we're talking about political philosophy, I just No, we didn't want to, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we won't answer, we'll just sit. Okay, go on, sorry, go on. Um, let's forget that. I, I'm just curious what your uh, political views are. In general, where do you, you see yourselves in, in, in the classical liberalism of Mises or in the uh, philosophy? That's a rather impertinent question. <laughs> Well, it's, it's Anthal's choice to answer or not. Are you expecting three answers or what? No, no, I, I just... What's the thing? question? What is your political view? Mine? Yeah, what are you... <laughs> About what? Generally. <laughs> <laughs> what political philosophy do you support? What political system do you espouse? What, what is... That of truth. Do you have any... any <laughs> truth, yeah. Conservative... Uh, any opinion in this? If I could answer for, for you, sir, just one minute. We're not here to convince people of stuff, to, to push a political agenda, this or that, and, and more or less what Keith said, we don't want to push philosophies and we kind of wander off. We're here to try to present the truth the best we know it, and the truth as it was known in the past, and perhaps new facets of the truth that emerge through research and study and so on. And then, do with it what you will. And, I, and again, I say what the Buddha said, don't believe a word I say, figure it out for yourself. And, you know, his political views are his. But if he wants to give them to you, that's fine. That's all I want to say. And I think that says it all. So, um, are there any more questions? Diego, did you want to ask something? Um, yes, but, I mean, it was more... Um, I mean, not really, not really. It's not really a question. It's uh, something I'm asking myself. Okay, good, good. Uh, then you figure out the answer. Excellent. <laughs> Love it. We're, we're, making, we're making a difference. <laughs> uh, any more? Any more questions? Okay. Um, I think we will do the gold basis stuff um, tomorrow. Well, tomorrow? Yeah, because... Well, we uh, still have six minutes. <laughs> no, no, I need the projection up, though. That's the only six thing. Six minutes? Do tomorrow. Yeah, because we need to get the projector up there, Professor. Oh, and, and yeah, but uh, comment on, on what, yes. ha what has happened. Okay. In yeah, the past the, the, the latest yeah. price okay. tick. What happened to backwardation? Okay. Where are we now? Yeah. What is a reasonable thing to expect and so on? Okay. Um, I hope everyone knows about contango and backwardation, and um, especially with reference to the bullion markets.
Um, if you don't, go to fecataresearch.com and have a read of uh, the gold basis, about the gold basis there. Or ask me after. Or ask the chairman of Fecata <laughs> Research, or indeed me, the secretary. Yeah. Uh, but what's been happening, um, especially over the past few months, was that you had gold and silver moving into quite large backwardations on an annualized basis. You hadn't seen that kind of annualized level since the end of 2008. Is it comparable or big? No, no, no. I mean, 2008 reached 3%. Um, the highest that we reached now was about 2.2, something so like that. So, it's not as... Not as high. So, it went down and then it's starting to, to go up now. The extent of the backwardation mm. reached. So, um, it started accelerating for gold quite aggressively in June-July time. Uh, with reference to the August contract and the, uh, the market went into a big, big backwardation just when every gold bug and financial journalist was telling you to sell gold, I think, because it's going to a thousand or five hundred or whatever. And the same thing was happening for silver as but, well. But silver started earlier. Silver started earlier. Silver has been in a backwardation for a long... Silver has been in permanent backwardation for a number of years now and um, it still hasn't defaulted which is why we need to refine the theory slightly in terms of the way we express it's not permanent backwardation no. but permanent and rising backwardation so I'll be talking about this later on okay so we're starting to see signs of that happening Obviously, it's a lot harder to say that something is permanent and rising as opposed to just permanent. So, it's a different topology. But you're starting to see signs of it occurring, and this was well in advance of all of this nonsense that brokers will say is the excuse for gold going up, you know. They don't come up with the uh, excuse as to why something is going to happen. When only after it's happened, they'll come up with the reasons. So, draggies, bond buying or whatever. But this was in the bases well before any of this stuff that's being mentioned now was in the public uh, marketplace. Okay? And a positive and rising co-basis, i.e. backwardation in the metals, means that the intention to exchange the metals for whatever is diminishing rapidly diminishing rapidly. And someone said an argument uh, against that was, well, gold is still there when it's mined, so how can it be diminishing, or how can, how can the supply diminish? Well, obviously, people's intentions with what they'll do with their gold is changing, not the actual gold itself. And that's changing. It's changing slowly. So there is a set of people, backwardation to me hinges on people changing their mindset from dollars to gold ounces and that's going to be a very slow somewhat I feel impossible sort of kind of thing to achieve the way people think in the current age but as people start to think in gold and silver ounces again as opposed to this abstract thing called a dollar whatever it is it's only going to get um, worse and let's see well, yeah. <laughs> the, the only way to access that information is through the basis and the Yes, yeah, yeah, you can only really, access it. There's no other way. No other way. We, and, and I think we are still the only public forum where this is being we treated. I, I am quite sure a lot of private, uh, big money speculators would do their own research, but they wouldn't share no. the information yes. with you. Yes, I'm now, we are the only one who are willing to share, and, and it's all there for everybody to criticize. You know, yeah. what we I say. Mean, it's very important that you remember that in this world, any financial variable you observe to do with interest rates is likely to be manipulated or incorrect. And the only thing that you have that's comparable to a market rate of interest 
is the basis. Okay, it's the only thing which you can say is the least manipulated out of anything that can be manipulated. <laughs> so if you thought that LIBOR was sacrosanct, obviously now you realise it's not, but I think everyone realised that anyway, you know, but this is the only thing to a natural interest rate that uh, exists. So that's why it's fundamentally important. Don't think about carry and this kind of thing, you should think about interest rates in terms of gold forward markets interest rates. So please uh, bring us up to date. At the end of August, mm. the gold price broke up, up yes. with silver price simultaneously. Yeah. Uh, so what happened to the... Well, those con the August gold contracts has expired. expired, you know, so... Options <coughs> to... Options to... Now the active contract is December. December isn't in backwardation yet. It's too far away. It's too far away, but I'd probably say, judging at its current trend, maybe another four weeks, five mm -hmm. weeks, something like that. And uh, the last time that December went into backwardation, um, it never did it this early. No. So the time at which each futures contract is moving into backwardation is uh, being pushed back mm -hmm. each time. Now what about silver? Silver, silver has also been doing the same. Um, and, and what is the next uh, big uh, uh, contract? It's December again. It's well, December. September, but that's coming up for expiring no, coins. No other month is expiring. No. Well, you do have the other yeah, months, but, but they're not, are not, active. They're yeah. not active. Yeah, the next contract that's is December. liquid is December. Yes. And silver is, the December silver is not in no, back. December silver isn't in backwardation yet, like December gold, but I imagine similarly within a similar time frame that it would move into backwardation as yeah. well. So, so the, haven't, haven't you observed in the last couple of weeks as the price has been rising, the basis has been rising and they removed away <coughs> from backwardation? Uh, well, the September contract had come down in backwardation as the price was rising, yes. I don't think there's any backwardation in September at the moment. Well, it's expiring in whatever... Right. Okay. But no, uh, the trend is still there for a positive co-basis. You know, just because something is looking like that, and it does that, doesn't mean that the trend is over. That's the trend. You know, so, uh, no. <laughs> So is there feedback from the uh, gold, the actual gold price, the cash price, or, to the uh, uh, futures market, as, uh, or, or it's just keeping the same trend? It's keeping the same trend. But if you've got a trend of rising co-basis, that's pretty that's much... new. No, no, no. The no. trend of rising co-basis is not, for not the December contract, isn't new. No, no. No, no, it's been in there for, for a while. And just because something that's done that suddenly does that, if you've learned technical analysis, you'll know that doesn't mean it's the end of a trend, you know. If it comes back and bounces up, then that's confirmation of the trend. No, what I was referring to is the more the price rises, the more the co basis is falling. Yeah, but yeah, you do get that. But I'm talking about the December contract. It hasn't happened for that, though. Yeah. So the December co-basis for gold has been going up since March. Mm. Right, but it's, it's backed off. I mean, I guess, it's, you know... Yeah, it hasn't backed off to March's level, though, has it? Mm. No, more like June's, I would say. But that's still well within an uptrend. Gold was nineteen hundred dollars already, then went down to fifteen hundred. And I caught that. And now it's going back. And, and I've it. caught that. Yeah. What more do you want me to cut? <laughs> well, for, for whatever it's worth, I, I look over these guys' shoulders and I've been watching these prices for many years and getting lots of reading lots of newsletters and all this and that and Sandeep's predictions or, or suggestions or whatever you want to call them trend stuff pans out very well thank you very nicely
So I, I have to say, it's the best I've seen in all these years. And I, is it going to be perfect? I doubt it. Is there such a thing as perfection? I doubt that too. But it's the best. It's like, is gold perfect money? No, what is perfect money? But it's the best we have. And he's got, I think today it's the best measure of... And the, the thing about this is, it's not paper stuff per se or, or whatever. It's actual people buying the actual physical gold and then doing their hedging in the markets and, and what they see as they buy and sell depending on what positions they're in. So it's extremely difficult to manipulate. Mm. The price is relatively easy to manipulate. So, Do you get more subscription after this breakout? Oh, I, I got uh, 10 new subscriptions in the past three weeks. Which is unusually Hi. Well, it might not be because of gold breaking out. It might have been for other reasons. Other reasons? <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> what other reasons could there be? Well, I think Rudy elaborated them on <laughs> the beginning of the lecture. It's called publicity. <laughs> ah, controversy sells. <laughs> ah, controversy sells. Ah, I see. <laughs> uh, thanks to Philip. <laughs> you have to fire a few more guys. And <laughs> ah, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it's, the, the ranks are swelling up nicely, Professor. That's nice. That's nice. Okay. Well, well, anybody think. wants to make a prediction what the gold price will be? I don't like that game, <laughs> but uh, I mean, how can we close that debate without asking the question? We should have a Friday afternoon gold price, I think. Everyone should give a, uh, an opinion. We should have one of these lotteries, you know, yes. place your bets and the yes. one who gets it wins or we'll something like hockey stage. games or soccer games. Yes. No, I'm just kidding. So what about the gold price at the end of the year? I'm just going to stick with safe broker talk and say two thousand dollars <laughs> i don't want to say anything so it will c cost i imagine it would yes by the end of the year yes but as i said it's very hard to to fix space if you're confident of in time you know so um, but i would suggest that yeah yeah that's interesting yeah there is somebody and what about your prediction at the new year's eve that at the end of, of 2012, mm. the euro dollar will be at 0.88. Um, you still stick to that? All right, we only got to 122 reason, so far. Or does the reason that Draghi policy change something in the mind? No, 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 no. I might change the level higher, but the the downward sentiment is still is still there. I mean, it's been going down pretty much for the whole year, the euro. You're right. Yeah. Yes, this, this is the second half of the year. Things yeah. do change quite rapidly. <laughs> well, if you're buying bonds, I can't, uh, and you're going to be doing that by creating demand deposits somewhere. I can't. Well, anyway, that's another uh, that's another talk. But I can't see the euro strengthening continually against the dollar, apart from this sort of euphoria effect that everything is okay. Thank you very much, Thank Sandeep. You. That was very informative. And thank you very much, Rudy. We enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. I have one more tomorrow. Tomorrow morning. Oh, that's right. Adam Smith. Adam Smith.